Before my colleagues exit the chamber, um, I want to I want to acknowledge your words. I want to thank you, uh, the, the passion, the emotion, uh, the true rawness in your words are words that I think all of us as, as members of the Senate should hear, reflect, and respect. And I just want you to know that I am thankful that I was here on the floor to personally um, hear because we can read words, but it is when we have the ability to hear and to feel those words that their true meaning comes out. So I appreciate and I thank you for that. Mr. President, I had asked to uh, come and speak on the floor of the Senate on this day, June 4th. I've been actually looking forward to it and planning speaking time um, for months now. June 4th is a, is a significant day uh, in the fight for women's suffrage. It was in, on June 4th of 2019 that Congress approved the amendment uh, and sent it to the states for ratification. And then it was in 2020 that the 19th Amendment was, was ratified by the states. So this was to be a time of, of celebration, of recognition, of, of women's suffrage, this centennial event. And since that time that I first looked to, to schedule this, my how the world has changed. We have been in the midst of a pandemic over 100,000 American lives lost to the COVID-19 virus. We are in the midst of, of an economic crisis, the likes of which we haven't seen in, in decades and decades. And just less than just a week ago now, uh, we witnessed the killing of George Floyd on our streets in broad daylight. And today, June 4th, is not only a recognition of women's suffrage, but it's the funeral of George Floyd. So before I speak to the matter which I intended to speak on today, I want to just briefly comment on where, where I believe we are as a nation right now. I was walking in to work this morning and in one of my, in, in my neighbor's yard is a, is a placard, a yard sign, it's been there for some, some years actually now. But it is a uh, partial quote of Martin Luther King that states, we can't be silent about the things that matter. When you think about those things that matter, equality, justice, the fundamental truth that all human beings are created equal and endowed by God with certain rights. And when those rights are denied, when they're violated, it is our responsibility to address the injustice. It is not our responsibility as elected members of the United States Senate. It is our responsibility as fellow humans, as Americans who believe in these principles of justice and equality. President Bush had some words this week that uh, I found very direct, very comforting at a difficult time when it's hard to be comforted, when our spirits are so discomforted and agitated right now. 
but he said, he reminded us that achieving justice for all is the duty of all. It's the duty of all. And we, we are hurting now as a nation. We have wounds from racism that have never been allowed to heal. And those words were just, just shared here on this floor moments ago. Wounds that have never been allowed to heal, wounds that are still so open and raw. And healing can't take place until the hurt and the anger and the anguish that so many in this country still feel, so many African Americans, so many, so many who feel that the system is meant for somebody but not them, that there is not equal justice under the law. It must be the law for somebody else. Mr. President, this has, this has been hard, hard on all of us. As we have seen the, the protests, many of them peaceful, in my home state, Alaskans coming together with a shared sense of duty and responsibility to speak up about things that matter, and doing so in a way that brings us together rather than divides, we, we must condemn the violence that we see on the street with the looting. But stopping the looting is not going to close this wound. We heal when we acknowledge our weaknesses, when we acknowledge our failures, and we vow to address the things that matter, like equality and justice. And what we say and how we say it truly matters. I have been challenged by some. I have been uh, chastised by some. Um, some very close friends who have said, you're silent, Lisa. Why are you silent? Why haven't you, you, fixed what, what we are seeing? And I have struggled. I have struggled with the right words. As a white woman born and raised in, in Alaska with a, a family, that was, was privileged, I can't feel that openness and rawness that I just heard expressed by my friends Corey and Kamala. I haven't lived their life, but I can listen, and I can educate myself, and I can try to be a healer at a time when we need to be healed. And that's my commitment and my pledge going forward to those I serve in Alaska and to those I serve here in this country. This is, this is challenging for us, Mr. President. We know this, but we are an extraordinary country. We are an extraordinary people with extraordinary resilience. So let me turn to the fight, the century fight for women's suffrage, the right to vote, the right to be treated equally, the right to be heard, it is, it is a history that is, is long and interesting, um, sometimes very colorful. I've had an opportunity um, this past couple of weeks to, to be reading a collection of stories about how women in the West worked to, to really be the vanguards, if you will, on the suffrage movement 
You don't necessarily hear them uh, spoken to um, with great frequency, but in fairness, it is many of those western states. It was Wyoming that was the first mover. And so reading some of their stories was a good reminder, a good reminder of the role that, that many in Alaska have also played. We've been relatively progressive when it comes to women's rights. So progressive that many Alaska women received equal voting rights with men in 1913. This was seven years before the 19th Amendment was ratified. Alaska was still a territory and was still going to be a territory for a long time going forward. The sorry and the sad part of that history, though, was that not all Alaskan women were given that right to vote. Alaska Native women were excluded, and they were excluded based on citizenship and civility assessment as well as literacy tests that prevented Alaska Natives, and not, not, just, not just the women, but some Native men, from voting for several more decades. We recognize um, through, through a state uh, day of observation and recognition uh, the work of Elizabeth Paratrovich, an Alaska Native woman from southeastern Alaska who was the driving force between behind our first anti-discrimination law. This was back in 1945, nearly 20 years before Congress passed the Civil Rights Act. This year, on the 75th anniversary of the bill's passage, the U.S. Mint has actually created a gold coin in her honor. And as you look at that coin and reflect on her role and the significance of that proud, strong, fierce Native woman leader. You can't help but be proud of her. The fight for women suffrage was waged, as we know, for decades and decades. But again, the women in the West led the way. As I was reading the, the recount of, of the Alaska suffrage initiative, it was reflected that the women in Alaska didn't really have to work that hard to, to get it, that it was just, quote, provided to them. I think there's more to that history than that. But they, the newspaper publication at the time, the Daily Alaskan in 1904, argued that while women's suffrage might be disfavored as a general proposition, the merits were different in Alaska. And he says, the women there are brave and noble helpers in the development of a frontier country and not the pampered dolls of society. So today, I think it still, uh, still probably holds true that we've got some, some pretty strong women in Alaska. We own and operate fishing vessels. We work as oil rig operators, diesel mechanics. We've got some extraordinary Alaska women industry leaders leading our Alaska Native corporations, uh, leading our oil companies, our, our leaders in education, our advocates for children and seniors and victims of domestic violence. They truly have helped not only our state but our country. The 100th anniversary of women's suffrage is a reminder of the progress that we've made as a nation, but we know that we have more to do, that inequities remain, whether in the workforce, uh, pay equality. And so continuing that work is, is a matter that we have not relaxed on. And that work, that work, Mr. President, includes getting the Equal Rights Amendment signed into law. The Equal Rights Amendment was first written and introduced by Alice Paul at a conference commemorating the 75th anniversary of the Seneca Falls Convention in 1923, but it wasn't until 1972 that the ERA passed through Congress and was sent to the states with a seven-year deadline for ratification that was eventually extended until 1982. It's a pretty simple amendment. It's pretty short. 
equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. That's the Equal Rights Amendment, in addition to the implementing provisions following that. But that's, that's the context. In Alaska, I'm proud to say that we were one of the early adopters, having ratified the Equal Rights Amendment on April 5th in 1972. More recently, Virginia became the 38th state to have ratified the amendment, which brings us to the three-fourths threshold needed for ratification. But unfortunately, this milestone has been reached after the deadline for ratification had already expired. And so Senator Cardin and I have introduced a resolution, SJ Res 6, which would remove the time limit from the joint resolution that passed the Congress in 1972. I have asserted time and time again, and Senator Carter, so many, we have said you cannot put a time limit on women's equality. It's been 100 years since women were granted the equal right of voting. Women's equality is fundamental to the American way of life, and it's far past time to be expressly recognized in the Constitution. So I thank Senator Cardin for his leadership working on this resolution with me and all the members of Congress who have fought with us in support of the ERA. I thank the advocates who continue to call their senators, call their congressmen, who lift their voices to support this important cause. We have work to do. We will continue that work. Mr. President, I want to note that my colleague, Senator Cardin, was here on the floor, was planning to speak to this matter today, uh, but our, our time schedule has got compressed, so his statement has been included as part of the record. But I want to acknowledge the good work and the partnership that we have on this. And with this, Mr. President, I thank you and I yield the floor.